Hi, my name is Mike Foley, and we are here for another episode of vSphere Quick Bites. And uh, today I have Bob Plankers from uh, from our group in tech marketing. And Bob, why don't you introduce yourself and tell us what you do at VMware? Yeah, what is it I do around here, huh? The uh, uh... So I'm Bob Plankers. I'm a senior technical marketing architect, and I took over what Mike was doing, uh, security and compliance messaging and communications and things like that. Uh, help a lot of a lot of different groups understand security and compliance and how those two are related. Yeah, lots of different stuff. So thanks for having me on. Cool. So I'll put on my Bob Plankers glasses, and now no one will tell the difference between the two of us. <laughs> Okay. Very strikingly okay. similar. Yes. All right. So, um, what are we going to talk about today? I mean, I've been out of the security space now and doing vSphere with Tanzu from a from a vSphere admin standpoint now for over a year, and I've been following the security stuff only because it's of interest to me. But in your words, what 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 feature are we going to talk about to today? Because I know there's a lot of stuff that went into seven O. Yeah, uh, vSphere 7 has has got a bunch of stuff, you know, uh, improvements to what was there before and new things too. A uh, new thing that we could talk about right now is the native key provider that was new in vSphere 7 Update 2. Yeah, that's something you and I were begging for a couple of years ago to, to get people going with, with uh, encryption primarily because the whole point of standing up a full key manager system was a stumbling block or in some cases a roadblock for for a lot of customers what is the native key provider which should be self-evident what does the native key provider uh, do for customers well one of the things that it does is it does exactly what you described it really enables people to start doing vtpm in vm encryption vsan encryption the vsan guys really love it and uh, uh you know because uh, it is uh, not not everyone has an external key management system, uh, third party key management system, uh, something separate. But a lot of a lot of organizations do have that, you know. But maybe there's some political things there. Maybe there's uh, uh, structural issues with it. I know some organizations host their KMSs inside the infrastructure, the, their vSphere infrastructure, which makes for a dependency loop if vSphere is to try to use that. That sort of right. thing. And so the idea behind native key provider was to allow some flexibility there. It's, you know, uh, we should talk a little bit about what it's, what it's good for, what it's not good for, and that. But the idea that that it's an option, that you can turn it on right from the start. And uh, one of the other things, too, is you can enable VTPM, the, the virtual trusted platform module, yep. uh, for workloads. That's now licensed across the entire stack. All versions of vSphere can turn that on with native key provider. And so that's uh, uh, instant security for workloads, so especially you don't, ones that you want to use a bit locker and need, things. You don't need just enterprise plus in order to enable key nope. provider. If you've got vSphere, vSphere of any type, any type of vSphere, you can turn on VTPM and native key provider, and uh, and you're good to go there. So VM encryption and vSAN encryption require the higher license levels. I believe vSAN Enterprise and Enterprise Plus for vSphere. But uh, uh, VTPM, because it's it's ubiquitous and it's a requirement moving forward for a lot of Windows platforms and that, uh, you know, we just enabled it everywhere, and that's really cool. So I can only imagine that, that some people will say, okay, well, there was the whole KMS topology, and that was, you know, it was pretty intense, and it was really designed for production level, and I had written an article on KMS topology to deal with DR situations and stuff like that. Uh, would you consider native key provider something that a customer could run in a production environment? Absolutely. If we ship it with the product, we basically mean that it's for use wherever, you know, like, and it's a tool in your toolbox, you know, like, I say that, but you know, like security stuff, you know, the, 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 the saying kind of the glib saying in my mind is just because you can doesn't mean you should sometimes, you know, just because you have a screwdriver doesn't mean that it's the appropriate thing to work on the electrical outlet with, you know, like the, uh, uh, so there's pros and cons there, you know, the third party KMS stores a keys, stores keys somewhere else, you know, and so for remote offices and any, any place where somebody could steal the whole cluster, you know, they're going to steal, they're going to be able to turn it on and 
get the keys the way the native the way that native keeper writer stores that it's not just vcenter server but it also pushes the keys down into the hosts as well uses trusted platform modules on the host to store the keys if you've got one if you, you can uh, uh, choose to not have have it do that too it's less security but you know again flexibility not everyone's in the same the same spot and so trying to meet people where they are as the saying goes but, uh, um, you know, so there's some pros and cons there. If you're not too worried about somebody picking up and stealing the whole cluster, then Native Key Provider might be a good solution as well, you know. And so, again, you know, there's always trade-offs. Security is always a set of trade-offs. Sure. Uh, believe me, I know. Uh, I mean, the, one of the first things I would always ask a, a customer when they were worried about security was, uh, do you have a lock on the door to wherever your systems are, to the data center? Yeah. And, uh, you know, invariably, some customers would say, there's no lock, it's it's in the closet. Or it's Information in the data should be center, free. But everybody has access to that. So, well, yeah. security starts with physical security. security. Yeah. Right? You know, you know, well, what's the old adage? If if you have physical possession of a device, it's yours, you know, like it's... it's game over. It's game over, you know, and there's all, there's certain new technologies that are trying to fix some of that, uh, but the uh, uh, but it's still true. It really is. If if you can get physically to to, to a device, it's probably going to be yours. So, how does native native key provider work? Is that a separate VM? Is it part of vCenter? And if it's part of vCenter, oh, it is. Okay, yes. great. Yep. Okay. Uh, so that means it's probably also going to work with vCenter HA, right? Right. Absolutely. So anything that vCenter can do, vCenter HA can can replicate and make highly available. Uh, what it does is it creates a. Uh, uh, so when you set up the native key provider, you go into vCenter server and, and go into the UI and the HTML5 client or whatever you're doing. You can use APIs for it as well, and you can just pick a standard key provider or native key provider. Uh, or if you're using vSphere Trust Authority, you could use do the trusted key providers as well. And uh, the uh, um, so yeah, lots of options for key providers. The uh, uh, when you set it up, it'll ask you a few questions. You'll have to give it a name. Honestly, that's the hardest part about all of the stuff. What do you name it? And then it'll prompt you to back up. Uh, once it sets it up, it'll prompt you to back up the uh, uh, the key derivation key. The key derivation key is sort of the primary key in the whole system, and in a, uh, it is very much like the key encryption key with VM uh, encryption. You know, same same purpose but it's named uh, same rough purpose but it's named differently because it's treated differently uh the key derivation key is stored on vcenter server but it's also pushed out to the hosts as well so that the hosts can do the decryption and then from there it's very much like vm encryption where there's a, a, a data encryption key used for the vms themselves and then the key derivation key is used to encrypt the uh the data encryption key so so it's going to the portability be the same so if I have two VMs, obviously they're going to have separate data encryption keys, but they're all going to have the same derivation key. key. And, yep. yep, key derivation key. Oh, just like with VM encryption, where it'll have the same key encryption key, the, uh, uh, well, that's not necessary. No, no, it, actually each one would get, it, each getting, one from, gets it. getting from a KMS, you, each one's going to get a unique key encryption yep. key. Yeah, and then there's different data encryption keys inside the VM. Right. You know, right. so there's one KDK key derivation key, and then there's the separate uh, DEX as well, the data encryption keys. Okay, cool. So similar, similar but different. different. You know, even I, you know, as you can see, even I, thinking about all this stuff, uh, you know, well, at, it's, at, easy, at, it's at, easy to see why people get confused. At, at at the end of the day, can I click the box that says VTPM? Yes. Yeah. There yeah, you absolutely. go. Then I think the problem is well, solved. And you can migrate. So if you start with this, and one of the coolest things about this is you can start with the native key provider and you can move to a KMS sure. if, uh, if later. You just you can just do some rekeying operations there. No big deal. One line of uh, PowerShell should do it. Basically. And uh, uh, so it lets you get started. And this is really important. The reason the vSAN guys really like it is that uh, SSDs and flash are notoriously difficult to sanitize. And yes. because of the, the wear level, wear leveling algorithms, if you buy a terabyte SSD, a terabyte NVMe flash device, 
it's probably 1.2 terabytes, something like that. And it's yeah. doing its own sparing and wear leveling and all that stuff. So, you know, you take a traditional spinning disk, spinning rust sort of approach to sanitization and just write a terabyte of random stuff on there. There's no guarantee that you, yeah, you didn't get that extra 20% that's, that's sitting there. You know, and um, the other thing that complicates that, you might say, well, uh, don't some of these devices have secure erase functions? Yeah, some of them advertise that they do. A lot of them ad actually advertise uh, that they have a secure erase. But it's been found that many of them don't actually do it right. Uh, many of them just use the same key regardless. You know, like you, you uh, the idea be behind secure erase is that the drive controller on the d device itself is doing some encryption. And that it can just erase the key, and every and your data is unrecoverable. But if it's always using a string of sixteen zeros, for example, which was found to be the key on some of the devices, you know, no matter what you do, it's always the key. You know, well, that's not secure, you know. And so trusting, it's really hard to trust SSDs when it comes to sanitization. Many large organizations uh, just choose to destroy them straight up. You know? Yeah, I mean, it's very expensive to to deal with that. It's also a management nightmare having to manage all of those different, each of these different well, unique devices, sometimes using different methods from different vendors. And if you have a yeah, mix well, and match, forget it. You know, it just, it's crazy. It's far easier to just click the box and encrypt the VM. Just encrypt it from the start, you know. And, and then, then if that's it moves around, you guarantee that it's still encrypted. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. The best way to ensure that you can sanitize it is to never store it in the clear to start with. So speaking of moving around, and we'll probably use this as the last question. Um, speaking of moving around, can I move these VMs to another cluster? I mean, is there oh, a way absolutely. of linking the, the, the key? Do I run two native key encryption providers or do I... Yep. How, so how just like K, just like KMSs, uh, the traditional uh, key provider methods, where you just want to make sure that the keys, whatever key provider you're using, has the same keys in it for your VM. So when vCenter server goes to request the key, uh, it gets the right answer. That's that's the yeah. goal, right? Uh, so what you can do is you can yeah recreate that same that same native key provider instance on your DR site and you can import the kdk you can import the key derivation key either uh yeah the one that you backed up you can export it just from the uh the the uh, ui or you can just uh take what was backed up initially when you were setting it up and just re-import it at the other location so all your replication works great you know if you're using third-party replication tools that'll work fine that sort of thing cool uh okay so any blog articles that you have on any of this Yep, we've got some stuff uh, up on core.vmware.com about right. how this works and, and how the keys the get pushed that. down. And then we've, uh, yeah, there's been some blog posts. Uh, there's some new stuff coming out. Uh, we're putting together a, a lot more information about this this sort of thing, so stay tuned. Core.vmware.com is the place to go. So to wrap up, your name's Bob Plankers. We've been talking about key encryption keys and native key providers and all sorts of other fun stuff like that that you can use in production today yeah, okay. with yes, vSphere please. 7. All right. Thanks, Bob. Appreciate it. Thank, Thank you, Mike. Take, Take care. care. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.